poison was always the silent killer. Kings and emperors fell prey to it as easily as an unsuspecting servant. Throughout medieval and classical history, poison and those who knew how to prepare it played a huge role in the internal affairs of many a court. Assassins were feared and herbalists were employed to concoct the most deadly poisons possible, all with the aim to remove competitors, enemies, and usurpers. Today we're taking a look at the infamous Locusta of Gaul. Employed as the favorite poisoner of the Roman Emperor Nero, this woman ended many lives with her deadly poisons. From the wild woods of Gaul all the way to the marble courts of Rome, this woman's story is a true, deadly drama. Wildly considered as one of the earliest documented serial killers, Locusta was certainly a deadly dame. But is there more to her story? Revenge? Hate? Sorrow? Let's find out. Welcome, patrons, to the second episode of Poisonous Affair, where we're taking a look at Locusta of Gaul. I'm not too sure how many of you are familiar with Locusta of Gaul, but I found out about her not too long ago, actually, through a book I was reading about, well, Roman emperors and the women behind the scenes, let's say, of the Roman Empire. Um, really good read. I actually forgot, as always, I'm so shit with names, so I forgot who the book was by. Um... But if I can look on Scribed, I'll uh, let you know which one. It was It was a really interesting and like, really good book to read, actually. Um, but yeah, so I found out about her and I was like, mm, let me do it for February. So here we are today. I hope you're ready. Let's take a look at the earliest historical mention of Locusta of Gaul. In ancient Rome, poisons were a common weapon often used with cunning skill. Emperors used them to depose unwanted pretenders and heirs to the throne, to eliminate staunch enemies, or to get rid of unwanted commanders. Murder by poison gave less involvement and a better alibi. You could actually say that you were at the feast, <laughs> a witness to this, and it's like, in your mind, you're like, yeah, I'm the one who actually said to poison that motherfucker. <laughs> There was no need for weapons or bloodshed, as an assassin could simply insert the poison into food or drink in a critical moment. Fear of such an assassination became so widespread in Roman society that many important individuals, mostly emperors, hired special servants that would act as food tasters. These were often the cooks as well. And to find a proper herbalist and maker of poisons, Roman emperors did not hesitate to look in all corners of their empire. And so it was that in the lands of their province of Gaul, they discovered a skilled woman, well-versed in the use of wild herbs, plants, and poisons. Lacusta was her name, and she was most likely captured sometime before 54 AD and brought to Rome where her deadly skills would be utilized. And her skill as a maker of poisons was quickly recognized. So it came to be that Lacusta of Gaul was hired as the official poisoner of the imperial court. There, she became the favorite of Emperor Nero, who, as we all know, had a particular affinity for all things deadly and odd. Locusta was certainly a historical figure, and what we can learn about her deeds was documented by ancient historians such as Tacitus, Juvenal, Cassius Dio, and Suetonius. She was first mentioned in the service of Agrippina Minor, one of the most prominent female figures of the Julio-Claudian dynasty of Rome and the mother of the future Emperor Nero. Empress Agrippina made Lacusta of Gaul her poisons expert, and some sources claim that with her assistance, the Empress conspired to murder her husband, Claudius. Before this occurred, though, Lacusta is mentioned as being imprisoned in 54 AD and condemned for a poisoning charge. And this is how it would be said in Latin, Nuper ven Venefici Damnata. God, my Latin is so bad. I mean, I still remember when I was like 10, 11 years old in Catholic school learning Latin. <laughs> I'm so shit. It was at this point that Agrippina employed Locusta's deadly services. The latter produced a poison to kill Claudius, which was purportedly sprinkled on mushrooms in his dinner. It is also possible that the mushroom itself was the poison, the so-called death cap mushroom. 
Agrippina's influence was seemingly quite considerable, as she managed to turn those close to Claudius against him. So it was that that the poisoned food was given to the emperor by his very own food taster, Halotus. But the poison was not strong enough, and death was drawn out. Claudius was then finished off by his own doctor, my goodness, Gaius Sturtinius Xenophon, who inserted a feather into the emperor's mouth in order to induce vomiting. But guess what, folks? The feather itself was coated with more poison, and it was that that killed Claudius. With the emperor gone, Agrippina paved the way for her son, Nero, who would later try to kill his mother, and succeeded the second time around. This ungrateful motherfucker! Can you imagine? I mean, I know that families are all sorts of fucked up. I mean, look, seriously, what family does not have its own secrets and isn't fucked up in today's world? But imagine living to the point of where you're constantly paranoid that either your kids are going to poison you, you're going to kill your kids, or I don't know what, like your uncle is in the way, so you get you decide to like kill him. Your mother's in the way of something, so you decide to kill It's like everybody's so paranoid that everybody's out to to get them and most of the time it was pretty much right they all were trying to kill each other and mind you it's not really the lower classes it's obviously the higher you know the higher classes and you're just like oh my god <laughs> what a time like a lot of people like romanticize the past and think oh it would be so nice to live no folks no I think you need to read up on your history before you actually speak about how nice it would be to live in the past because it was all shit let me tell you it's shit today, and it was shit back then. <laughs> Let's get back to the story of Locusta, and now we will take a look at Locusta in the service of Nero. The next time we hear of Locusta is during the reign of Nero, a mere year after the death of Claudius in 55 AD. Several sources state that Locusta was imprisoned on charges of Claudius's death, but that the new emperor, Nero, pardoned her and employed her once again. He needed her deadly services. You see, Claudius had a son, a young boy named Britannicus, and Nero feared that the boy would become a threat to his rule and usurp the throne, even though he wasn't even a teenager. So Locusta was to concoct a poison which would kill Britannicus as swiftly as possible. Now, historical sources state that Locusta used belladonna, commonly known as deadly nightshade, and quite possibly used arsenic, henbane, Mandrake, aconite from monk's hood, colchicum, 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 I'm not too sure, hellebore, and yew extract. My goodness, couldn't you have just stayed with one? <laughs> These are among the most efficient and well-known poisons in ancient Rome, so you just decided to put everything together. My, my. When the time to poison Britannicus came, it seemingly failed the first time. It seems that Locusta opted for arsenic, but used too small a dose in order to make the death seem more natural and not so suspicious. Nero also wanted to do it cautiously, but was furious when the assassination didn't work out. He personally flogged Locusta for her failure and ordered her to give the full dose. Nero no longer cared about caution. And to ensure the effectiveness of the poison, Nero ordered Locusta to test it out on children. Oh my god. When deaths were either too slow or the poison ineffective, they ramped it up until they were satisfied with the results. How fucking sick. Britannicus was thus positioned at a dinner. He was brought a hot beverage, which his food taster had to taste. When all was well, Britannicus ordered it to be cooled down, which was promptly done with poisoned water. This time, Locusta's poison worked. Britannicus immediately suffered its effects, with Tacitus stating that the boy immediately lost alike both voice and breath. Pancakes don't. <laughs> I have pancakes who wants to come onto the desk. Furthermore, young Britannicus suffered from epileptic fits throughout his life, and Nero used this as the cause claiming that the boy was having a seizure and should not be touched. The boy would later die. After this event, Nero was seemingly well pleased with his chief poisoner from Gaul and decided to grant her many prestigious rewards, including her own estates and servants. 
He also sent her pupils, which were <laughs> to be taught the ways of poison making. Pancakes, stop it. I can't see. <laughs> stop. Pancakes. I'm not too sure if you can hear, but Pancakes is right under the microphone. I'm not too sure if you can hear her, like, purring. But my goodness, you're taking up the whole desk and I can't fucking see Pancakes. Did you just put your ass in my coffee? Pancakes! Several sources state that Nero granted Lacusta the permission to test her various poisons on slaves, animals, and convicted criminals, which were sent to her often. If this is correct, then it's quite certain that Lacusta of Gaul was indeed one of the earliest documented serial killers, having murdered many people in cold blood. But all that eventually came to an end. The riches, the prominence, the protection. When Nero committed suicide in 68 AD, Lacusta surely knew that her situation would only worsen. Without the emperor's protection and her deeds well known to all, she was in danger. When new emperor Galba came to power, he ordered her to be seized. Alongside several freedmen that were Nero's close associates, including Petrobius, Narcissus, Helios, and others, according to Cassius Dio, Locusta was sentenced to death. Cassius Dio names her and all the others in that category as, and I quote, the scum that had come to the surface in Nero's day. She was dragged through the streets of Rome and then executed. Locusta of Gaul and her poisonous arts were no more. But one has to wonder about Locusta of Gaul as a person, her underlying motives, and her intentions. These are the things that we cannot learn from our historical sources, but we can still discuss them. Could there have been more to her than just pure motivation and thirst for power? Firstly, we can assume that as she bore the epithet of Gaul, Locusta was born Gaulish. It could be that she was captured and made a slave initially before her skills with herbs was recognized. Also from this, we can deduce that perhaps Lacusta's motives were those of personal revenge, a yearning to wreak havoc on the conquerors that took her captive and away from her home. As she had the means, the folkloric knowledge of herbs and nature, Lacusta could have used her knowledge in ways that would allow her to exact revenge on the Romans by poisoning them. It would be a fitting act of a personal war of a simple Gaulish slave and the perfect background for an assassin, having no warm feelings for those whose lives she was to take. The use of poisons in Roman times was no oddity. Many relied on them and dabbled in those deadly arts. Many contemporary historians wrote on this, including Suetonius, Galen, Nicander, Pliny the Elder, Scribonius Largus, and Dioscorides. Oh my goodness, the names. In general, there were three types of poisons— mineral, herbal, and animal poisons. The mineral ones included arsenic, antimony, mercury, copper, and lead, and were unstable and thus rarely used. Animal poisons were mostly ineffective and the produce of folk tales, and included such odd concoctions including bull's blood, toads, and salamanders. Of course, there were also poisonous spiders, snakes, and scorpions, but they were difficult to use and thus rare. But herbal poison proved to be diverse, effective, and easy to use and conceal. These were usually derivatives of plants with belladonna alkaloids such as henbane, datura, mandrake, or deadly nightshade. Historians also tell us of the several occurrences of poisoning and even name exactly which ones were used in the deed. So, for example, we have the popular figure of Canidia from Horace's poems who favored hemlock in honey as poison. We also know that Seneca himself drank hemlock, while Ovid cites aconite as the poison of mother-in-laws. <laughs> my, my. But, of course, it was the imperial court where poisons were mostly used. Surviving examples are many, but I'll only name a few. So, for example, we have Drusus, the son and heir of Tiberius, who was slowly poisoned by his wife, Claudia, Livia, Julia, and her accomplice, Lucius Aleus Sejanus. Of course, there is the death of Claudius at the hands of his niece and wife, Agrippina. I forgot to mention that previously, that 
he she was his niece. But anyway, Nero Claudius Drassus, son Germanicus, a skilled Roman general, was also poisoned over time by Piso. Germanicus's wife, Agrippina the Elder, was known to have a fear of being poisoned and was weary of anything she ate. I mean, like I said, you live, you were paranoid, absolutely terrified and paranoid. And some of the well-known emperors either committed or attempted murders by poison, including Domitian, Commodus, Caracalla, Caligula, Nero, Elagabalus, and Vitilius. A well-known historical reference tells us that Caligula had a huge trunk filled with various poisons, and that Nero himself carried a special poison made by Lacusta of Gaul in case he had to commit suicide. Oh my goodness. Nero relied heavily on poisons, and perhaps for that reason named Lacosta his chief poisoner. He poisoned his own aunt, Domitia Lepida Major, and seized her estates. The woman suffered extreme constipation, perhaps from poison. Nero visited her and immediately ordered a fatal dose of laxative to be administered. It is claimed that he was the one who poisoned his once chief advisor, Sextus, by replacing his medicines with poison. We can realize from such examples that poison was one of the major methods of murder in ancient Rome. The silent killer. It was usually unexpected and caught its victims off guard. Are you sure about that? Because I'm telling you, <laughs> everybody lived with paranoia. Everybody was paranoid back then. And for women such as Lacosta of Gaul, there was plenty of work to be had. Lacosta was not the only woman poisoner in ancient Rome. Horace mentions a deadly female trio that was infamous for their arts in potions, Martina, Lacosta, and Canidia, the black widows of Rome. This use of immoral weapons shows us a clear shift from the much more honorable and poetic times of Caesar, Cicero, and those before them where the noble death was common. With the likes of Nero, greed and power struggles became rampant, and in such an environment, poison rules. And that, my friends, is the story of La Costa of Gaul and the use of poisons in ancient Rome. Like I've said many times before, let's not romanticize the past and show it for what it really was. I hope you enjoyed this episode about La Costa. I'll be adding some images to this file, this audio file, so you can check out um, some pictures of some of the plants and mushrooms that she would have used back in the day, and also um, some paintings and sketches of what people believed La Costa looked like. I would like again to apologize for the delay in putting this up on Patreon, but oh my God, this weekend was just absolute craziness and I just didn't have the time um, to get this done. But finally today, I got it done. So I hope you enjoyed again the second episode of Poisonous Affairs where we took a look at La Costa of Gaul. I wanted to wish you a very happy Valentine's Day tomorrow. However you celebrate it, I want to send you my love and thank you so much for everything. You'll hear from me again on Saturday, I hope. <laughs> I'm not going to promise, but I seriously hope I'll be able to upload the next Poisonous Affair episode for you to enjoy over the weekend. Take care, my loves. Bye.